Okay, well, I'll get started. So hi, everyone. I'm Courtney Worrell. I'm the president of the Waterfront Alliance. The Waterfront Alliance is an organization based in New York and New Jersey. We were established about 16 years ago. Uh, we work in this region, but we also work nationally on many different climate resilience initiatives. But also we work with youth and uh, and the maritime industry and all of the different sectors that play a very strong role in the New York, New Jersey Harbor and all the many, many land uses that make up what is uh, one of the most industrialized but also most natural um, urban areas um, in, in the United States. So we're really excited today to talk about climate resilience and the solutions that are very many for coastal climate resilience and living with climate change um, and the effects of climate change in uh, urban areas as well. So um, I just will talk a little bit about what the Waterfront Alliance does specifically for climate resilience and then I'll introduce our speakers. So the Waterfront Alliance, among many different initiatives, is the spearheading organization and the founding organization of the Rise to Resilience Coalition. The Rise to Resilience Coalition is the way in which many organizations come together and fight for legislation, policy, regulatory reform, and other means of changing the systems which must be put into place for resilience to climate change. So just a couple of examples, we recently were able to work with all of our partners um, and partners in government to pass a law in New York and a law in New Jersey, both statewide, which required disclosure of flood risks and historic flooding for all, for all residential rental or uh, home sale transactions. But also we're responsible for legislation in New York City, which requires New York City to complete a comprehensive climate resilience strategy. So those are just some examples of the ways in which we are working on climate resilience. So today we're gonna to talk about the, the, the fundamentals of what is happening to our region um, and to many regions um, also just by example, when it comes to climate impacts and then how the responses are formed, how what they are, uh, how those responses are advocated for, and the role that many, many people play in putting into place a multitude of solutions that can bring us climate resilience over time. I also, so I'm really excited actually to introduce our uh, the panelists, but I'm going to start with Kate Boycourt, and Kate is actually responsible for the work that she did with the Waterfront Alliance over several years to launch the Rise to Resilience Coalition. So we're thrilled to have Kate with us, who is now the Director of Climate Resilient Coasts and Watersheds for, uh, for New York, New Jersey at the Environmental Defense Fund. So welcome, Kate. We're also joined by Jordan Salinger, who's a Senior Advisor on Climate Ready Infrastructure at New York City's Mayor's, Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. We will refer to this uh, Mayor's Office as MOCEJ. And also we are joined by Pen Pamela Pettyjohn, who is the founder of the Coney Island Beautification Project, which was founded shortly after, after Hurricane Sandy and is also a board member of the Waterfront Alliance. And we're joined by Tyler Taba, Senior, Man Senior Manager for Climate Policy at the Waterfront Alliance and also the lead for climate, uh, the lead for re the Rise Resilience Coalition and all things making that happen. So. With that, uh, we're going to start with uh, with the first question. And um, I'm, I, as I mentioned before, maybe not everyone was here when I started, but I, I hope that people find this this webinar and the information shared today really interesting and an important part of the overall climate change conversation happening this week, where we're going to be focusing on resilience. And resilience is a key part of the full response to all solutions that we need to move forward with, with climate change. And we really encourage you to get involved with the Waterfront Alliance. If you're interested in hearing more and being a part of the work that needs to be done simultaneously with climate mitigation, which is also very, very, as we know, the fundamental action that all of us must take. So with that, um, I'm going to ask Pamela to start and then uh, Jordan to follow, but if, Pamela and Jordan, you can tell us what um, what are some of the extreme weather challenges and climate challenges that the New York City and New Jersey, New York and 
New Jersey actually metropolitan region, but also New York City, what, what we're facing um, in terms of these climate impacts. So go ahead, Pamela. Okay. I, I think that some of the things that we're facing right now, I think we see um, happening all around us. And um, we know that eventually we'll, New York is going to go through the same thing. So one of the things is there's extreme heat. We've seen this all over the country. I believe California had the uh, highest recorded temperature of 134 degrees. Um, and that was just the uh, temperature alone. Um, I saw that Oregon was um, uh, 119 degrees. And we've had these uh, so-called heat waves last uh, 19, 20 days in a row. So this is a... a, a this is something that we see that's, that's going across the country. But uh, some of the solutions in, on, that we're, we're looking at are, are trees. Uh, New York City is in the middle of, um, we just passed, uh, I mean, New York City just passed two bills to increase the uh, canopy of, um, the, of trees, which will help reduce some of that temperature. Um, we've seen the effects of forest fires in Canada, New Jersey, and other places, which are part of that heat um, that we're experiencing, and then also um, has an increase, um, you know, if all these things have a lasting effect on us, you know, will have a, an effect on our food supply and our health. Um, and uh, they are waterfront alliances uh, uh, leading the way in, in trying to inform communities of how, what they can do and be safe and and I'm going to turn it over to Jordan. Thanks Pamela and, and thanks Courtney for 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 having us. Um I think the the overall premise uh of, of the panel is 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 critical and and certainly uh something that is uh, uh, uh important to to our office and 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 I think critical on 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 in terms of messaging that there is not a kind of one silver bullet solution uh, that uh, as we move forward, it's really uh, uh, working uh, to find solutions across these, these climate hazards. As mentioned before, heat, the, the deadliest uh, of our climate threats, uh, but also uh, coastal surge, uh, 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 sea level rise, uh, and extreme rain. Um, so in, in, in terms of, of what our office, as, as mentioned before, uh, MOCEJ uh, is, is working on, uh, uh, many of you are familiar, uh, city released, uh, uh, a plan YC update uh, uh, back in April. Um, and uh, to just to highlight a, a few initiatives, uh, first, uh, as referenced before, the 30% uh, uh, goal on, on tree canopy uh, across the city, because it's not just about new trees, uh, but it's about preserving and enhancing uh, our existing stock. Um, another initiative uh, that got uh, some attention uh, was our housing mobility program, um, uh, or, or uh, more commonly uh, referred to as, as, as buyouts. Uh, this was an announcement of a, of a voluntary program that is, is truly human-centered. Um, and once again, another tool uh, that, that we hope to have in our toolkit uh, and, and we'll be standing up uh, shortly. The third uh, is an announcement of a new bureau at DEP uh, for coastal resilience uh, and, and a deputy commissioner uh, that we should be uh, announcing uh, in, in, in the coming weeks, uh, truly about uh, embedding this, this kind of uh, existing knowledge across our city family and ensuring uh, that we're up for the challenge and we're, and we're properly staffing and, and thinking through operations and maintenance uh, uh, because rolling out and uh, you know, making sure these systems, these coastal defense systems are in place is of critical importance to the city. So actually, I'm going to go back to you, Pamela, and if you could just really, I, I know this is hard to say in a, a short amount of time, but if you want to just say a few things about your personal experience with Hurricane Sandy, and also um, what you and others are seeing from uh, sunny day flooding that's happening in, in parts of the city. Well, uh, I watched, uh, I, I experienced um, my being destroyed in my community destroyed during Superstorm Sandy. And I saw and understood just how unprepared our community have beautification has been working to help the community through any kind of emergency right now. I see movement 
the out um, to community oh. members to help uh, the community be able to. Hey, Pamela, you're you're cutting out. Do you want to turn off your video? To potentially, that would help with your with the. Um, yeah, sorry about that, Pamela. Can can you hear us now? So actually, I'm gonna have I'm gonna move over to uh, to Kate to to actually talk a little bit about Hurricane Sandy and and sunny day flooding, and then I'll turn it back to Pamela if she can hear us. So go ahead, Kate. Um, <clears throat> sure. Well, uh, I can. I mean. This could be broad. Um, yeah, but just maybe <laughs> just like a yeah. few, you know, a few anecdotes just to put yeah. some of this in context in terms of like what what's actually happening on the ground. Yeah. So in terms of Hurricane Sandy, I think what we saw uh, was just a, a, a total catastrophe that really informed a lot of the lessons learned um, that we're thinking about now from preparedness just for disasters and response. Uh, I think we completely that, that completely failed, and we saw cases in Rockaway where um, you got elderly people that live ten stories up, and the elevators aren't working for weeks. There's no heat. Um, there were cases in which, uh, because the Red Cross and others were not deployed in advance, um, volunteers had to go in and bring critical medicines to people in their buildings um, where I lived, which was luckily out of the floodplain. I was very lucky in that um, I saw gas lines for miles on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn uh, because we'd had interrupted supply chains for fuel. Um, and there was a lot of conversation about how if, if the storm had hit a couple hours later and hit Hunts Point Market, that we would be having food lines. So there were a lot of impacts um, to from that devastating storm. And I think the the sort of more regular impacts and um, due to tidal flooding and also rain. It's not just Ida. We had a huge devastating storm in Ida um, back in 21, but also we've had regular devastating storms since then. Uh, it's become a regular thing that's impacted homes, roadways, and livelihoods. Uh, I'm not sure, Pamela, is your internet a little bit better just to, in case you want to speak about tidal? Flooding. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, there's a lot going on here. I just want to say that um, there are agencies that are working together and uh, that can work together to um, help mitigate some of this flooding. One of the things is um, you know, DEP. We've given out the uh, flood barriers um, with um, DEP. Also, we had the uh, Harbor Protectors Program, which is keeping the storm drains clean, which helps keep flooding out of homes and keeps the uh, trash out of our, um, our waterways. And also, we've uh, worked with the sanitation department in order to bring um, uh, adopt a can, which is, uh, you know, where you can take care of a, a garbage can and, and um, you know, uh, keep it neat and, and replace the bags, but it also keeps the trash out of our trash, uh, out of our storm drains. And we saw doing um, one of the big storms, I think it was Ida or Irene, um, where we didn't, Coney Island didn't have that devastating flooding that the rest of the city had and we were wondering what was different in our community and we realized it was the combination of all these things of that people can do everyday people can do keeping those storm drains cleaned out making sure that you adopt a can and trash is not going into the waterways and um, making sure that we use the, the uh, water barriers all these things help to keep that devastating flooding from happening to a community that floods during uh, blue skies yeah, um, and uh, one of the iconic pictures of Hurricane Ida was of the Major Deegan Highway um, in the Bronx, and which was flooded mostly because uh, catch basins were full of trash. So trash is in, it's really important. Actually, so with this, I'm going to pass it off to Tyler to, to start talking about some solutions, and then Kate, I'll, I'll pass it off to you as well. So Tyler, if you want to say a few more, a, a, a few more things about additional uh, solutions, either infrastructure or otherwise, in this theme of no single solution. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Courtney, and thanks everybody. Um, so, I think, yeah, I think the theme of the of the webinar and of the panel is that there's no single solution. And as much as we all wish that there was a silver bullet, um, we know that there's not. Um, and it's going to take a whole host of solutions. So that's 
that comes from things like planning and policy. And, and Courtney mentioned a couple of the policies that we worked on as a coalition together, which is flood disclosure and comprehensive planning. But um, you know that also has to be coupled, I think, with adequate levels of funding. So you can see that there's been some infrastructure projects that are coming to New York City specifically, especially in Lower Manhattan as part of the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Project. Um, so those are maybe some of the bigger examples of infrastructure. And then there's some localized in infrastructure examples like the living breakwaters off the coast of Staten Island or the Blue Belt system in Staten Island. Um, and so you have this kind of mix of, of large infrastructure and small infrastructure, but also green infrastructure and gray infrastructure and making sure that we're aware that we need all of those solutions and there's not just one big one that's gonna save us. Um, and on top of the, I guess, dedicated funding or on top of the adequate levels of funding, I think it's also dedicated funding. And, and that comes because of a little bit of what I think Pamela and Kate touched on after Sandy is that we see a lot of infusions of funding after a disaster. And so a lot of infrastructure and a lot of um, planning and processes have gone on post Sandy or happened post Sandy. Some of that is visible, like some of the lower Manhattan infrastructure that I just mentioned, you know, they have the East side coastal resiliency project, which if you're, you know, take a ferry, um, on the East River, you can see it actually under construction right now. There's been some dune restoration and beach restoration and renourishment in Southern Brooklyn and Queens. There's also uh, not so visible infrastructure that's also really important, like um, taking some of the critical infrastructure and NYCHA towers and elevating them out of the first floor and up to higher ground so that if there is flooding, um, you know, you're not losing power or heat or the MTA trying to protect subway openings and fortifying pumps. And I think all that was to say that a, a lot of this happened as a result of Sandy because our systems failed so so badly during that storm. But but again, a lot of that happened because of Sandy. And now some of the planning that happened after that is sitting on a shelf. And so, you know, one solution I think which is easy to call out is to have this dedicated funding for climate resilience to move those plans forward and think about how to tie some of these plans together. And I know Jordan might get to this, but I think the city is already thinking about doing this, where they're thinking creatively about how to apply for state and federal funding. And even within their own budgets, it's interesting to think about how you might integrate funding for public access to the waterfront with climate resilience or transportation. You know, Courtney, you mentioned the major Deacon flooding. How do you embed transportation funding with resilience or decarbonization with resilience? Um, on Monday, I heard NYCHA's Deputy Director of Sustainability talking about the heat pump program in the NYCHA towers, and uh, she referenced how one of the needs for that heat pump program was because the boilers in NYCHA buildings were failing during heavy rain events and they would get they would flood. And so I think that's just one direct example of how these systems are and challenges are intertwined. And so, um, you know, ultimately resilience is embedded into all of our systems and, and in the broadest sense, not just flooding or coastal resilience, but also extreme heat and not just resilient infrastructure, but resilient communities and keeping neighborhoods tied together. So the full social climate economic resilience um, in its in its broadest terms, I think. So I definitely want to move on to the, the government response. But Kate, before we do that, if you could quickly just I think it would be interesting to hear from you the difference between gray infrastructure and green infrastructure. And when people hear that term, those two terms, like this is very tangibly, what 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 does that mean? And what should be what should people be looking out for in terms of especially green infrastructure? Sure. And I think um, one thing just to first of all, Tyler's right on all on all accounts. We sort of have operating through a bailout system essentially right now with post structured around uh, following up after a storm. Um, and with thinking about green and gray infrastructure, I think it's also really important to think, as we're thinking about solutions, we need to understand how we got here in the first place, which is that most of our floodplains and the areas that flood today are yesterday's wetlands and streams. And we saw that again and again, continue to see that in our region. And so as we think about both stop doing the things that that we did poorly before, uh, but also thinking about how do we how do we dig out of this mess and build better communities that are safer? Um, we really need to think about that history. So and that that history also was deeply unequal. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of legacies of, of the way that communities were developed or disinvested along racial lines that I think is important to acknowledge. Um, 
So green and gray infrastructure is is really, uh, you know, you've got your your seawalls, that's gray infrastructure, we sort of shorthanded, and then there's wetlands and um, planted dunes and things like that that we call green infrastructure. In an urban area, there's also a lot of in-between green and gray. Uh, you've got bioswales, you've got uh, tree pits, things that capture stormwater when it rains. Um, and then you've also got some of these hybrid infrastructure where you have, say, a park and a levee that are intertwined. Um, and this, there's a whole suite of solutions and they're really, uh, the applicability of these solutions really depends um, on the scale, the density, and what communities want. And big shout out to the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program that Waterfront Alliance leads. Um, it's a really helpful tool to sort of guide how you think about those challenges at the site scale. That's right. Yeah, and that they're, the green and gray can go together. That, that's just a, and, and have to in many urban areas. So, and Jordan, moving on to you and the, and the city's approach specifically, the government approach to this and kind of building off of what Tyler was saying about the need for funding and then these these um, urban solutions, what how is the city approaching some of this? Sure, so I, I think one of our, our, our newest flagship programs uh, is called Climate Strong Communities. Uh, it really does blend uh, kind of a number of the topics we've, we've just been, go been going through, you know, fundamentally, uh, you know, how can we address uh, some of the historical injustices and direct resources to environmental justice communities. And, and so that uh, was, was critical in, in uh, uh, how we selected some of our, our first pilot neighborhoods. Uh, but at its core, uh, the, the, the program is really designed to meet the moment of, of what we see as, as pretty historic uh, uh, federal funding across, once again, across these, these, these multiple hazards. Uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, the, the program is, is structured to uh, uh, have robust community engagement uh, and mirror that with uh, uh, putting together competitive applications uh, for uh, the dollars we see coming from FEMA, from NOAA, uh, from uh, the alphabet soup of our, our, our federal uh, funding partners, as well as the State Bond Act. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, I, I think what we have certainly heard uh, is that, you know, planning process is important, uh, but uh, folks want results. They, you know, they want to, to kind of go outside and, and, and see a, a change rather than, than kind of folks continuing to, to talk ad nauseum. Um, so I, I think we're, we're going to start rolling out some of our engagement uh, later this fall, but already working on uh, uh, going after some of those, those federal dollars uh, that, that we, we do think uh, will be game changers uh, for, for many of these neighborhoods. So oh, actually, um, thank you, Jordan. I'm going to move on to Pamela because you're actually in a New York City office right now. So you want to tell us uh, what you're doing in the city's response on the emergency response side? Well, first of all, I would like to give a, a, a shout out to the coalitions that we've been working with. Uh, and that's with the uh, Rise to Resilient Coalition. It's with the uh, uh, Forest for All NYC. Without these coalitions and when... Uh, and, we would not get half of the things done that we have accomplished. I mean, we have people that we bring together that are good with policy, like Kate. We have people that uh, are very good with uh, community outreach. We have people that are, are really great with planning and sitting everyone down and everyone is volunteering their time to come together to find out solutions. And without these coalitions, Coney Island wouldn't even be a part of the conversation right now because the Army Corps of Engineers did not include South Brooklyn in their plan for the Hats um, um, uh, uh, plan. And we had to fight for two years with the Coalition of Rise to Resilience Coalition to include Coney Island. So without these four coalitions and their strength and all the people coming together with all this knowledge, we wouldn't have the program that Jordan just spoke about, the climate ready communities. These wouldn't even have been a thought, but I wanna thank uh, everyone for all their time and coming together and fighting for all of, the, all of the smaller communities and organizations that don't have that kind of power. And thank you for being there to include us to make so that we are a part of all of this. And I'm sorry, Courtney, what was your question? <laughs> well, I was just thinking of more questions based on what you said. <laughs> but I was thinking more, if you had anything to say about disaster preparedness and that that's a, that we often think about 
climate resilience in a, in an infrastructure and what are we going to build to make things better frame of mind. But you've also mentioned a few things such as just picking up trash and, and making sure we have good waste management is a, is a climate resilience solution. But are there any, are there other things that you can say in terms of solutions that are non-structural or non-infrastructure based? Well, the, we didn't, we, uh, Coney Island or South Brooklyn did not get the investment in uh, resiliency that other communities did. It just wasn't there. If you look on paper, it says that we got uh, some new store, uh, storm sewers and or uh, a few different things, but it wasn't for the people that live in, in uh, Coney Island. It was for new development to make sure that they could sustain that. So when we looked around and saw that other, uh, um, other communities were getting billions of dollars coming out of uh, uh, Washington to protect their communities. And we weren't getting those kind of any of that uh, uh, investment in Coney Island. We tried to figure out how can we help the people, even if it's something like uh, uh, harbor protectors or picking up trash or being on right now, I'm in um, the Office of Emergency Management and how to make sure that people are prepared, um, just like you did when you were a child, uh, a fire drill, you knew exactly where to go, what to do um, when the fire alarm went off. Well, that's all we have to offer right now is to try to make sure that the communities are prepared for before a, a disaster or an emergency, during and after, um, until we do get those uh, in, that infrastructure. Being that we had to fight for two years to be included with the Army Corps of Engineers, their solution was to just put up floodgates and they really didn't look at the fact that Coney Island is um, is kind of is unique. It's uh, a peninsula that's only three blocks wide and we host millions of visitors a year. And there's over 60,000 people that live here all year round and 10,000 new units of housing coming. So there is a, a lot of, uh, uh, different uh, uh, uniqueness to Coney Island and the Coney Island community that needs to be looked in further. Um, Army Corps of Engineers uh, looked at things like storm surge and looking at what uh, an 11-year-old storm, which was Superstorm Sandy, which changed all of our lives and our languages. But in the meantime, there's so many, we're looking at extreme flooding. We're looking at uh, uh, extreme rains. We're looking at tidal flooding. We're looking at how um, flooding and, and the uh, water comes up through the storm drains. All of these things need to be taken in consideration. And uh, Coney Island has uh, taken ownership of their community and they're pulling together. We're trying to come up with a plan, a community-led plan to present to the Army Corps of Engineers instead of saying what we don't want. Uh, I think that uh, the community is the best people to say what they do know, uh, want and what they do need. They are the experts. They've uh, got lived experience. They've been here and, and they can tell you which way that water is going to flow and where it's going to flood. And uh, hopefully someone will listen and, and uh, we will be more than happy to share our plan with you also, Jordan. Uh, if <laughs> when we when we are coming up with it, we are working with Cornell University and the uh, Aquarium and Coney Island Beautification Project to lead this plan. So um, I'm going to go off script. Yeah, <laughs> Pamela, uh, thank you so much, and can't agree with you more on all of that. And I I think I want to have Tyler um, explain to the audience what the Army Corps plan is. So I have a feeling that a lot of people listening in are like, well, what, and what does the army have to do with any of this at all? <laughs> There's some just, so I think just some of the very basics, like what this, what the army corps is doing, what they proposed originally in terms of the big gates. And, you know, I think that would be really helpful just yeah. in the basics. Yeah. Sure. I'm happy to, I'm happy to do it. And I'll let Kate, fill in any gaps that I might miss as well, because we've been <laughs> leading, I think we've been working all together and there's lots of great partners who have been, who have been on this big, big behemoth of a project, which is the Army Corps. So um, so the Army Corps of Engineers after Hurricane Sandy was authorized to do a study to look at the flood risk in the Northeast region and identify some of the key areas with high flood risk. 
Um, and the New York and New Jersey Harbor region was uh, identified as one of the priority areas of concern. And so the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study, the acronym that we use there is HATS. Um, uh, that, that project is a proposal from the from the Corps of Engineers for the New York and New Jersey Harbor region. Um, and it's it's a it's a big infrastructure project that would span a lot of New York City, parts of New Jersey, um, not so much of upstate New York and, and not so much of Long Island. I think there's some other efforts that the Corps is working on on, on Long Island. But um, this would be the proposal that you may have seen that has a fifty two point six billion dollar price tag. Um, there's about 12, I think, storm surge barriers that the Corps is proposing in various waterways across our region. So in Jamaica Bay, in Gowanus Canal, in Newtown Creek, Throgs Neck, um, the Arthur Kill, the Kill Van Cole, and I may be forgetting a couple, but um, these would be big storm surge barriers that would open and close um, when, a, when a storm is coming through our region. And I think the focus of the core on this big project has really been storm surge alone and hurricanes and, and Sandy. And I think a lot of that is because this was born out of Sandy. But to Pamela's point, I mean, I can't say it any better than how Pamela just said it. We're dealing with all these other climate risks now of sea level rise and tidal flooding and extreme rainfall and water coming from under the ground. And so a plan of that magnitude and of that caliber should be addressing all of these risks together and not just one singular risk. And I think our fear as kind of the advocates, and I think the city also to some extent does, shares that sentiment is that we want a multi-hazard uh, uh, study. We want a multi-hazard plan and approach to this. And that goes back to what we were talking about with green infrastructure and gray infrastructure and combining those two things and addressing these multiple flood risks. Um, and you know, there's a lot I think to say about the fundability of a, of a study like this, $52 billion, zero of that has actually been authorized by anybody. So we'd have to fight for that money through Congress. And if we have a really strong plan that has buy-in from the community, I think you can make that case to your elected officials to go to bat for the plan. But if, if we're dealing with what the core is proposing for us right now, which is a very singular study that's um, – you know, a lot of seawalls and a lot of gray concrete infrastructure in our region. I don't know that you're going to have the the buy-in from the community to really go out and champion um, those kind of project, that kind of project, and 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 bring it to our region. But there's an important role for the core to play here, and and I think we're 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 all, we're all working together on that. And I I would be remiss if I didn't let Kate chime in. So, yeah, Kate, go ahead if you have anything to add. Yeah, and it's just been it's been fast, fantastic to work with Tyler over the years, um, and and with Pamela, and uh, frankly, recently with the the city a lot on this stuff. Um, I think Tyler really covered the the scope of the project really well. I'm actually going to just highlight a few wins of change and opportunity here. So we did a pretty heroic uh, effort, I think, as an advocacy community in changing federal law twice uh, for this project and all coastal storm risk management projects across the nation to do a couple different things. One was to try to expand the community engagement process. I think we um, haven't really fully succeeded in that yet. Uh, there, there were some improvements uh, we fought hard for, including the extension of the public process from 60 days to about 150 um, and uh, definitely a lot, a lot more uh, engagements than originally planned by the Corps last year. Um, but we still are at a point where the states and the city have to say yes or no, ostensibly, to the plan. And it hasn't even been revised based on public comment. And it, it still is not including those multiple flood hazards that we have already. So it's kind of like saying, I'm gonna put all my eggs in one basket for this one type of flooding that we have while pretending these others don't exist. And in some waterways, they are much more important. They're not you know, as critical everywhere. Um, so the other thing that we uh, really worked on with a lot of advocates across the country was to make it really, really clear that all types of flooding can be considered for different types of projects. So we got that changed in the last Water Resources Development Act. Um, and uh, I, I should say shout out to the city and the mayor's office for particularly pushing to try to get all non-federal sponsors and, and we're hoping that everybody will come together and make that formal request um, so that the study can be revised uh, to include those types of flooding where, where they're appropriate. Um, that's something that 
uh, we, we did get some alignment uh, and very close alignment with the city on, and I just uh, really have enjoyed working with the mayor's office on that. Um, Congress actually has also just been a fantastic partner by <laughs> pushing for those changes uh, and recently uh, sending a letter to the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works um, just this past week, uh, pushing for many of these priorities in the study. So um, I think, you know, this is a long game, like Tyler mentioned and, and Pamela mentioned, um, but it's important. It's an opportunity for money to supplement. Um, and frankly, the money that we've got primarily is federal money appropriated after Sandy. And that's true kind of across the nation. That's part of that bailout strategy. And this is not just a New York problem, but that is probably going to change. And so thinking about how do we how do we kind of try to bring together these strategies and also um, em empower uh, the states and the city to step up in a leadership role in partnership with the core. I think that's something that we're really hoping uh, that everybody will lead a little bit more on this study um, and, and beyond. It's not just the Army Corps study. There's plenty of other things as we're talking about um, that need to be done, but this is an important one to pay attention to. Um, last thing I'll say on this is we have an active campaign that uh, that we're doing, and you can actually take action today um, on that to write a letter to your elected leaders um, supporting these priorities in the study. Right. So um, I'm gonna. We were gonna talk a little bit more about a little bit more about advocacy, but I think what we should do, just so we have enough time for Q and A, is to move on to just talking a little bit more specifically from each of your perspectives, either a personal or a professional challenge related to all of this or a organizational or government challenge to all of the things we talked about today that is top of mind for you. So I think we'll start with Jordan. So wh what do you see as like me, the two or three biggest challenges in, in climate resilience lit, lit, writ large um, and either, either from your professional opinion or from the perspective of the city? Sure. So I, I think to kind of uh, continue the, the, the conversation, it really is about funding. Um, and we, we do see this opportunity with the Army Corps as generational and um, I think it's essential that we get it right. I think we can concur that there are uh, challenges uh, working with the Army Corps, but uh, I, I think at the end of the day, to the point of uh, making sure that there's a palatable plan for, for all that can be appropriated. I, I think that's um, you know, kind of mirrored a, a lot of the comments uh, from ad advocates kind of our concerns. Um, and so now it is incumbent on the Army Corps to, to respond. Um, and so I, I think, you know, uh, it's always about the kind of scale of, of, of the challenge and scale of resources at $52 billion. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it, Sometimes you can kind of take your ball and, and go home, but I, I think uh, this is a moment where we need to come together uh, uh, because once again, the, the scale and the ability of the Army Corps to, to, to really uh, uh, address some of our, our, our huge issues. Some of the other um, uh, funding pots that I mentioned before, in particular, the, the FEMA BRIC program is capped at $50 million, for example. That is a large number, uh, but once again, for the scale of the challenge, uh, it, it is uh, not significant enough. So I think that's an, an area that we're, we're, we're pushing to, to increase the cap. Um, and uh, once again, as, as we kind of work through the other programs, I, I think that's uh, uh, something that we, we'd ask for, for assistance uh, from, from the advocacy world. One last push, certainly on, on governance. Um, you know, I, I think uh, speaking kind of after Sandy, it was a lot of kind of reaction and, and you know, what can we do to, to address uh, the immediate concerns, how can we get folks back in their homes? Uh, but I, I think as we look kind of the next 10 years, it's about creating governance mechanisms that, that really support um, these practices, these multi-hazard threats. How do we embed within our agencies? How do we create reliable uh, funding sources? Uh, and so there's been an idea of, uh, instead of entirely relying on the Army Corps, uh, creating a new formula funding program uh, for resiliency in this, you know, similar way that we fund transportation, um, I think that that would go a long way. Um, so it's really about creating consistency rather than relying on either the extreme event 
or some of these competitive programs where we're fighting against each other, fighting against other states. You know, how, how do we create kind of a, a more reliable mechanism? Great. So Pamela, as a very strong and active and energetic and knowledgeable community leader uh, working for your community and the people in your community, what do you see as the top two challenges that you face and that and that your community, uh, that you see your com community facing? I think uh, one of the top challenges for us right now is making sure that our community is informed and engaged, that the community understands how they're going to be affected by all these plans, that the community also knows that there's money that's available for uh, uh, like Coney Island is historically underserved community and environmental justice. And there's a uh, uh, justice 40 says that 40% of these large of these budgets coming out of federal dollars must be spent in environmental justice communities like Coney Island and getting the community to be able to feel empowered to sit down and make that plan and be able to spend that money or have a plan to spend that money before and not just sit there and wait for the leftovers and see if there's anything left over but be proactive and what they're asking for and what their needs are. Great. Um, and Tyler, what, what do you see as a, as a leader in front of, behind, and embedded within a coalition uh, as one of the two top challenges that you're facing and that the coalition is facing? Yeah, no, it's it's great. Thanks, Jordan and Pamela, for those answers. And I, I totally agree. I think there's a, there's a lot of challenges, but that also means I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to plug in and fill in some of those challenges. I mean, at a at a super broad level, I guess. And the reason a big impetus, I think, for this webinar is that we're still in the resilience and adaptation world, I think, catching up to our um, older sibling, I guess, which is uh, mitigation and sustainability that still continues, I think, to dominate funding and conversation. And and Courtney, you mentioned this at the beginning, It's it, that's the most important thing we can do, right? But there is this need that, or there is this um, reality that whether we decarbonize completely yesterday or tomorrow, we're still baked into a lot of these risks and 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 the experiences that people down in Coney Island and on Staten Island and in the South Bronx and all over the city are, are facing. And so I think the big challenge is still getting resilience and adaptation up to the same um, mainstream conversation in terms of funding and planning and um, wherewithal that that our, our, our counterparts in, in, in the mitigation and, and sustainability world are in. And especially as I've been attending Climate Week events, I'm seeing so much exciting stuff about decarbonization efforts in Local Law 97 and all this great work that's happening. And it really is exciting and um, I just think we're in a bit of a, we're in a bigger challenge, right? Where it's easy to say, we're going to go, our goal or our target is a hundred percent renewable energy by 2050, but for resilience and adaptation, it's a little harder to set those goals. And, um, you know, Kate is doing a great job leading on trying to understand how we can get those metrics and targets, um, identified, but I think that's been, that's been a big challenge. And then the other thing I would say really quickly is just something that's come up. That's really, really important in this conversation. And that is the emergency preparedness and the disaster preparedness work that needs to happen and the in, informing communities that Pamela is talking about right now. We're talking about the Army Corps, we're talking about this infrastructure and this funding, and we're seeing the long, the really long timelines with all of that. And, you know, sometimes it's 10 years, 15 years, some small infrastructure can move quicker, but, but what about today and tomorrow? And so making sure that we're addressing the needs of our neighbors um, in the short term. And I, I think that that's a, a role that I think we're hoping to fill at, at Waterfront Alliance with a lot of our partners in the coalition as well. Um, and it is National Preparedness Month this in September. So I, I had to make that uh, plug. Thank you, Tyler. Yes, it is. And Kate, from your perspective, as one of the policy, uh, one of the leaders and experts in climate resilience in our region, and, and I know um, in the Northeast, as you're pulling all this together and, and doing the advocacy and and also defining its strategy for government as well, what what do you see as the, the, the two challenges that you face and, and then the challenges broadly? Yeah, um, I think one, and, and these are maybe one and the same in terms of the particular challenges that, that I face as a professional, but also that we face broadly. Um, one really builds on 
something that everything has been everybody has been saying about governance. And I think our governance largely is has been disjointed and unadapted for the problem. And this this really plays out or played out in Hurricane Sandy, where we had maybe many different agencies that are leading projects that are just adjoining to each other, right? And in some cases, having as is the case with the Army Corps of Engineers, um, where this is the city is there's different climate projections and standards, right? That were um, that that different agencies have. Um, those are just a few specific examples, and. I think there are some bright spots there, just reiterating uh, Jordan's point about the uh, Bureau of Flood Resilience, which is a totally new departmental level agency that will be long term focused on this issue to think about everything like the uh, clearing out of storm drains, like Pamela mentioned, to these larger infrastructure projects. So having that housed in a place where you can point to and be hold accountable and also that is thinking about this in a more comprehensive way. I think the mayor's office has done a good job of like trying to hold that together, um, but you really need that long-term expertise uh, agency with funding. Um, and we also need that sort of echoed in a framework from the federal level on down and back up. So that's something that I think really needs uh, improvement. Um, related to that is just adapting our regulations and policies so that we're we're not sort of continuing to do worse. Um, I think just shout out to the Rise to Resilience Coalition, there was a law that was passed that now requires all city funded infrastructure by 2026 to be built to a climate resilience standard from schools to streets. Um, frankly, I think there should be an equivalent to local law 97 for public and private. So we're grading our infrastructure and our housing on uh, the same sort of A to F understandable scale, how, how risky are we? And then figuring out programs to get everybody up to speed in a way that's equitable. Um, and then I think that sort of other piece, which we haven't talked as much about today is that this is all really hard. It's, it's changing right now. And there's a lot that needs to happen that will require fundamental change. And, in our backyards, right? And so I think in addition to, to being advocates, we need to think about how do we build consensus amongst all the different parties uh, about land use changes and building changes. Right now you'll see, and we've seen in California, in New York State this past year, um, and a little bit in New Jersey while they're trying to implement very progressive flood rules, uh, housing coalitions and environmental coalitions are often at odds with each other. And the political will is not always aligned with where we do and don't develop, right? And so those are things that we need to figure out alignment and coalition building uh, and policy solutions for that benefit increases in affordable housing to address the crisis that we're in, where we need to go, uh, while also uh, maybe saying some places are a little bit too risky to further develop, and we might need even to think about more uh, relocation options in some places, while also um, thinking about how do we keep environmental protections in place. So that's something I hope to work on more and we're doing a little bit of, but um, just wanted to flag that as, a, as another huge challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And thanks for everybody for answering those questions, all of our panelists for answering those questions. And now we are going to answer some questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to highlight the question from um, Patricia Marcaida, who is asking about thoughts on resiliency planning that would include nature positive aspects and biodiversity habitat creation as equally important uh, in, in, the, in these solutions. So um, Tyler, I'll pass it off to you to, to answer this, this question. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it goes, it ties into hopefully the the message that I was trying to make in the in the idea of multi multi-solution, multi-hazard, and thinking about how all of these things are connected to each other. Um, I think that's the biggest, at least for me personally, when I look at some of the what the Army Corps is is proposing for our region and I see some of the the gray walls, um, it just it's a lack of creativity to me. It's a lack of understanding what the harbor used to look like and how we can, you know, not necessarily saying to go back to that, but to think about how we can take 
lessons and notes from the history of our of our harbor and of our estuary and bring that life back. And so that biodiversity and habitat creation and living shorelines and wetlands and all those great things that are that that fit ecological you know productivity in the harbor, but also can serve as flood risk reduction and can help you know can grow at, with, with rates of sea level rise and. You know, sure, maybe those things aren't necessarily going to protect us from a hurricane, Sandy, um, but they can address some of the more tidal flooding that we're seeing and some of the more everyday climate risks that we see in in the region. And so, I I, I couldn't agree more that I think we should be thinking about biodiversity and habitat connectivity and all these things together as part of a resilience um, solution. But I, I don't know if anyone else has any other better thoughts. Well, I'll just add myself just that there's all the there are so many opportunities with carbon sequestration as well, and that a living planet is a, is a sustainable planet and resilient planet. So I would just add that. All right, I'm I'm going to pass the next question off to Jordan. So this is a, a question or a comment actually from Klaus Jacob about the need for rezoning and the city's uh, what appears to be the city's continued. Um, placement of assets and, and allowing building in, in places that are prone to flooding. So any anything to say about rezoning as a climate resilience solution and also what the city's priorities are in, in terms of land use decisions? This is an important question, uh, one of the, the thorniest ones. So I, hopefully I don't put my foot in my mouth, but um, I, I think you know we are certainly uh, looking at all tools at our disposal. I, I mentioned before, uh, the, the the buyout program, uh, the, the housing mobility effort. Uh, it you know I, I think at at its core, it's really about you know we know we have an aff housing affordability crisis. We don't want to exacerbate it, but we we certainly do want to uh, make sure that we're building in in a way uh, that you know we can supply more stock. Uh, we aren't you know forcing folks out of their homes and they're you know purchasing. Uh, an equally risky uh, spot in, in New Jersey or, or, or somewhere else. So, um, you know, that is a, a program where we're standing up. Um, once again, is a, a voluntary effort. Um, and, and so I, I think there's there's more to come on that front. Uh, I know Klaus's question was was also on uh, on, on zoning. Uh, that is an, another tool. Uh, you know, city planning has has, uh, has has rolled out the zoning for for coastal flood resiliency. Uh, and, and I think that's a that's a that's a, another program that in, in, in coming years certainly could be used uh, more often, uh, because once again, going back to the, the key theme of this, it is not just about these infrastructure projects. It's about you know housing policy. It's about transportation policy. Um, and once again, I, I, I think it's fundamental that we don't ex you know, exacerbate uh, one crisis and, and, and solve for one and, and, and make the other worse. Thank you, Jordan. And I, I'm going to turn it off, uh, turn it to uh, to Pamela to to answer the question from uh, from Matia Miao in uh, in uh, Gowanus. Sorry for not pronouncing your name correctly. Um, but so the question is about solutions for the Gowanus area of Brooklyn for flooding. But I I'm wondering if Pamela, you could. Uh, answer by giving advice to to uh, community members in other parts of New York City or in other communities anywhere in the country in terms of how to get started in in this work. Yeah, I think that that's my question for you. Uh, well, um, one thing that I, I want to say is that um, climate solutions should be available to all communities. These. And the Gowanus and Coney Island Creek, uh, Newtown Creek and the Bronx River, we kind of share some of the same um, challenges, I'll say. And uh, how to get, how I got started in this was actually um, seeing, I lost my home and saw my, my community devastated and, um, and trying to figure out where to get help and realize that there wasn't any help. And so I had to step up, but um, there are there are support that there are the, the coalitions that I was um, speaking about, which uh, I think that they're an excellent tool uh, to help you um, to hone in on what the needs are in your community and be able to get advice and support and find out where um, resources are and actually have your voice heard. Um, to, to talk about the needs of the Gowanus. Um, I, I, I saw that um, 
after Sandy, my uh, community, it's been 11 years, it'll be 11 years in October, the end of October, and my community is still re rebuilding and some of us have still uh, in debt and still trying to uh, pay for the damages um, from Sandy. And I know that the Gowanus has been trying very hard, just like Coney Island Creek, to have those investments, the money spent, um, similar to what they're doing in Manhattan and lower Manhattan. And I think that um, I think that being a part of a coalition in that strength um, can bring those resources to our community. Thank you, Pamela. All right, Kate, I'm going to give you the last question. And thank you. To, I, I see that we have a number of additional questions. And Kate, I wanted to ask you about the question from Hey, yes, Lee, about the how we're how we can quantify prog progress in climate resilience, and you know, Tyler made a really good point, which is that it's it's quite easy, it's it's a lot easier with with de the decarbonization goals that we have because the units are measurable and are are much more finite finite than the units of measurement for climate resilience. So, any any thoughts on on that question about how we better quantify progress and and solutions? Sure, and and thank you for the the plug, Hellas. I don't know you, but uh, <laughs> it's actually very helpful. Um, so we, it's very hard, um, and that's you know partly because resilience touches many different things that we've been talking about today. So what is resilience? It, it you know it's it's everything from preparedness to food security to housing security, et cetera. Um, but we've been doing a project actually in, in partnership with Rise Resilience and, and many others over the past year um, and, and Regional Plan Association and Rebuild by Design to look at, uh, start actually from the question of what are the things that people care about uh, that have been articulated again and again and again in resilience planning efforts. Um, so we analyzed about 41 community-based community resilience plans and pulled out about 500 plus goals and try to consolidate them into their common themes. And we found um, that there were really amazing consistency and it actually uh, really goes to, it's it's very consistent with the literature in terms of how researchers think about what resilience is. Um, and then we've been working to identify measurable indicators that can match up with those goals. Um, and I think uh, I'll give you an example and sort of an overall way to think about it. Um, what we, and part of the impetus for this project was that there is no report card for resilience. I think Maryland is the only one that's done it and it's pretty qualitative and it's so hard to hold leadership accountable if you can't point to something and it's hard for people to manage as a, as a chief resilience officer at a city or sc state scale without that. Um, so what we've in, in a lot of the things that exist are social vulnerability indicators, vulnerability indicators and also exposure indicators. So that's everything from demographics. If you're low income, that's social vulnerability. If you're in a floodplain, that's exposure to risk. Um, but there's not sort of like, how are we doing? How, how resilient are we? Um, so some of the things that we've uh, come up with so far um, are things like looking at tree canopy cover, as um, and trying to pair that with those social vulnerabilities to understand, okay, how um, how resilient are we to to heat? I should a shout out. I think it, this is a city led uh, heat vulnerability index. Also serves as sort of a resilience index. They include air conditioners, a presence of air conditioners, tree canopy, um, and then income, and I think race uh, as as part of a vulnerability index. I think that's an example of where these things have been paired to really answer the question: How resilient are we to heat? And who and where, so um, we're we're kind of rolling out this project at the the end of this year. Uh, we're we're holding a workshop in the next couple of weeks about that, uh, but really eager to try to see that adopted and used as and and scaled because uh, that's something that doesn't really exist in the field so much yet. Great question. Yeah, great question. And I am sorry we can't get to all the questions. There there are a number that came in and really appreciate it. Thank you all for joining. Thanks to our panelists. I want to just. I was going to end by asking everyone to talk about what they hope that audience members do as an action, but I'm going to say it instead. So please get involved, get involved at your local level, join the Rise to Resilience Coalition, make sure that you work with government. Government is a partner in all of these solutions and make sure that your community members are aware of climate threats in their community and are prepared. If you live in New York City, check out Rainfall Ready. 
make sure you download the app that gives you information on emergency emergencies that may be happening in New York City. Know your zone, where to evacuate and in the case of a hurricane and lots of other resources. You can find some of them with the Waterfront Alliance and also on New York City website. So thank you all for joining and we hope to hear from you in the future. Have a great climate week. Thank you. Bye-bye.